Project C was a very impactful racial movement that helped to assist in the racial integration of Alabama in 1963. It happened in direct response to the Birmingham bombings that had occurred prior to the creation of the movement. Certain events were exaggerated and the use of media helped to galvanize the African American community into taking action. Songs such as You Better Leave Segregation Alone by Little Willie John, Titus Turner, and James McDougall reforms the media that the group used to spread their knowledge of the horrific events they witnessed. These classic nonviolent tactics helped to drive public opinion as well as sympathy for the people. Prior to the formation of Project C, Birmingham had experienced high levels of bombings from white government officials. Over 50 bombings occurred within 15 years, many of which were supported by law enforcement. Eugene Bull Connor was a key leader in the racial uproar and had close ties with the Ku Klux Klan members. Encouraging the violence that had resulted from altercations between innocent, nonviolent protesters and law enforcement. Very involved in Alabama politics, Connor pushed to be the nominated candidate for the Democratic Party, promising to buy quote-unquote 100 new police dogs for use in the event of more freedom rights. Martin Luther King Jr., head of the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, called Birmingham, Alabama, the worst big city in race relations in the United States. He wrote this on December 17, 1962, in a telegram to President Kennedy after the bombing of Birmingham's Bethel Church. Before that, when Bethel was Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth's church, it had been bombed twice. These are just three in over 50 bombings in 15 years in this city. A major demonstration in Birmingham could bring a much needed victory for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King worked with Wyatt T. Walker, Ralph Abernethy, Fred Shuttlesworth, and other SCLC leaders to devise a tactic. They called it Project C, the C standing for confrontation. Starting on April 3rd, 1963, it would grow in waves, first with sit-ins, then a boycott, and finally nonviolent protest marches daily, which were likely to galvanize heavy-handed reactions from police with mass arrests. The movement would hopefully spark in the media's input and everyone would see why black people are asking for justice in the South. By the time the plan was launched, Birmingham had become a city with no stable government. Albert Boutwell had just won the city's mayoral election, but his opponent, Bull Connor, was challenging the results. Connor, a segregationist, is still in charge of the police force. At first, only a few people joined Project C. Store managers began to shut down their lunch counters in response to sit-ins. Few activists were arrested and the news media paid little attention. On April 6, Shuttlesworth led the first march and was arrested along with 40 people, which was still too few for a major impact. On Good Friday, King and Albert Nathy were arrested along with 50 others and spent the next eight days behind bars. King and Albert Nathy were supposed to be held for 12 months at the maximum bail of $2,500 each. During this period, King read criticism of Project C in a smuggled in newspaper. In its margins, he began to pen a response. This had become famously known as his letter from the Birmingham jail. While King was in jail, one of his young members, named James Bevel, began to recruit and train youth to take part in nonviolent marches. Word spreads, and soon, students as young as six are ready to leave school and march in the streets. On May 2nd, they set forth on the first demonstration in what became known as the Children's March. Police arrested over 600 young people, but 1,500 more were ready to take their place the next day. Bull Connor ordered in police dogs and fire hoses. These special fire hose guns combined two fire hoses with one nozzle. The force was strong enough to peel bark from trees, pin demonstrators against walls, and roll young children down the streets. 
Images of people pummeled and drenched by high-pressure hoses and snarling German shepherds tearing clothes off demonstrators highlighted the news. With Birmingham's jails overflowing, thousands more students joined the demonstrations, sparking similar protests across the country. Before long, the story was making headlines around the world. On May 5th, Burke Marshall, who was the Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights, helped to get talks going between black and white community leaders in Birmingham. After several days of negotiations, a truce agreement was finally reached and announced to the press on May 10th. It said that, in exchange for the civil rights groups ending the demonstrations, business leaders would take the steps needed to integrate lunch counters, changing rooms, water fountains, and restrooms at downtown stores, as well as open better job opportunities for blacks. However, Alabama Governor George Wallace insisted that no local or state officials had knowledge of this agreement. On Saturday night, May 11th, bombs exploded at the Martin Luther King Jr.'s headquarters at the Gaston Motel and at the home of his brother, the Reverend A.D. King. Fortunately, Alfred Daniel and his family survived. Riots erupted and continued until the next morning. On Sunday evening, May 12th, in a radio and TV broadcast from the White House, President Kennedy announced that he was sending Burke Marshall back to Birmingham to consult with local residents, ordering armed force units to bases in the vicinity and taking preliminary measures to federalize the Alabama National Guard should their services be required. Governor Wallace was outraged and accused the president of disregarding the sovereignty of the state of Alabama. Despite the violence and continued opposition by white extremists, the peace agreement held and by summer, the city council had voted to repeal Birmingham's segregation ordinances. Project C was successful and young people had made a difference. The Birmingham campaign lasted from April 3rd to May 10th in 1963, and it was quite successful in reaching out to the community. One historian named Glenn Eskew wrote that the campaign led to an awakening to the evils of segregation and a need for reforms in the region. Although it wasn't until years after the major, major progress was seen, the series of lunch counter sit-ins, boycotts, and marches all helped to push for the race reform in the state. It also sparked an interest in the community to come together and address the struggles they had experienced from law enforcement. The Birmingham Movement and Project C is seen as one of the most important chapters in the Civil Rights Movement.